In December 1758, Pitt the Elder, in his role as head of British government, placed an order for the building of 12 ships, including a first-rate ship that would become HMS Victory. The commissioner at Chatham Dockyard was instructed to prepare a dry dock for the construction. The keel was laid on the 23rd of July 1759 in the old single dock, and the name Victory was chosen on October 1760. In 1759, the Seven Years' War was going well for Britain. Land victories had been won at Quebec and Minden, and naval battles had been won at Lagos and Quiburn Bay. It was the Year of Miracles, and the ship's name may have been chosen to commemorate the victories, or it may have been chosen simply because, out of seven names shortlisted, Victory was the only one not in use. A team of 150 workmen were assigned to construction of Victory's frame. Around 6,000 trees were used in her construction, of which 90% were oak and the remainder elm, pine, and fir. The wood of the hull was held in place by 6-foot copper bolts. Once the ship's frame had been built, it was normal to cover it up and leave it for several months to allow the wood to season. The end of the Seven Years' War meant that Victory remained in this condition for nearly three years. Work then restarted in autumn of 1763, and she was launched on the 7th of May, 1765, having cost 63,176 pounds and three shillings. Because there was no immediate use for her, she was placed in ordinary and moored in the River Medway. Internal fighting out continued in a somewhat desultory manner over the next four years. The sea trials were completed in 1769, after which she was returned to her Medway berth. She remained there until France joined the American War of Independence in 1778. Victory was now placed in active service as part of a general mobilization against the French threat. Victory was commissioned in March of 1778 under Captain John Lindsay. He held that position until May 1778, when Admiral Augustus Keppel made her his flagship and appointed Rear Admiral John Campbell as first captain and Captain Jonathan Faulkner as second captain. Keppel put the sea from Spithead on 9th of July 1778 with a force of around 29 ships of the line and on the 23rd of July sighted a French fleet of roughly equal force 100 miles west of Ushant. The French Admiral Louis Guillant Comte de Eurus, who had orders to avoid battle, was caught off from Brest. Maneuvering was made difficult by changing winds and driving rain, but eventually a battle became inevitable, with the British more or less in a column and the French in some confusion. However, the French managed to pass along the British line with their most advanced ships. At about quarter to twelve, Victory opened fire on Bretigny, which was being followed by Velle de Paris. The British van escaped with little loss, but Sir Hugh's Palliser's rear division suffered considerably. In March 1780, Victory's hull was sheathed with 3,923 sheets of copper below the waterline to protect it from shipworm. Victory's armaments were slightly upgraded in 1782 with the replacement of all her six pounders with 12 pounder cannons. Later, she also carried two carronade guns, firing 68 pound round shot. In October 1782, Victory, under Admiral Richard Howe, was the fleet flagship of a powerful escort flotilla for a convoy of transports which resupplied Gibraltar in the event of a blockade by the French and the Spanish navies. No resistance was encountered on entering the straits and the supplies were successfully uploaded. There was a minor engagement at the time of departure in which Victory did not fire a shot. The British ships were under orders to return home and did so without major incident. In 1796, First Captain Robert Calder and Second Captain George Gray commanded victory under Admiral Sir John Jarvis's flag. By the end of 1796, the British position in the Mediterranean had become untenable. Jarvis had stationed his fleet off Cape St. Vincent to prevent the Spanish sailing north. Whilst Horatio Nelson was to oversee the evacuation of Elba. Once the evacuation had been accomplished, Nelson in HMS Minerve sailed for Gibraltar. On learning that the Spanish fleet had passed by some days previous, Nelson left to rendezvous with Jervis on the 11th of February. The Spanish fleet, which had been blown off course by easterly gales, was that night working its way to Cadiz. The darkness and dense fog meant Nelson was able to pass through the enemy line, meant Nelson was able to pass through the enemy's fleet without being spotted and joined Jervis on February 13th. Jervis, whose fleet had been reinforced on February 5th, by five ships from Britain 
under Rear Admiral William Parker, now had 15 ships of the line. The following morning, Jervis received word that five Spanish battleships were to the southeast. By 0900 hours, the first enemy ships were visible from Victory's masthead, and at 1100 hours, Jervis gave the order to form line of battle. As the Spanish ships became visible to him, Calder reported the number to Jarvis, but when he reached 27, Jarvis replied, Enough, sir. No more of that. The die is cast, and if there are 50 sail, I will go through them. The Spanish were caught by surprise, sailing in two divisions with a gap that Jervis aimed to exploit. Jervis, realizing that the main bulk of the enemy fleet could now cross stern and reunite, ordered his ships to change course, but Sir Charles Thompson, leading the rear division, failed to comply. Nelson, who had transferred to HMS Captain, was the first to break off and attack the main fleet as Jervis had wanted, and other ships soon followed his example. The British fleet not only achieved its main objective, but also captured four ships. On the return to England, Victory was examined for seaworthiness and found to have significant weakness in her stern timber. She was declared unfit for active service and left anchored at Chatham Dockyard. In December 1796, she was ordered to be converted to a hospital ship to hold wounded French and Spanish prisoners of war. However, on October 8, 1799, HMS Impregnable was lost off Chichester. Now short of a first rate, the Admiralty decided to recondition victory. Work started in 1800, but as it proceeded, an increasing number of defects were found and repairs developed into a very extensive reconstruction. Her figurehead was replaced along with her mast, and her paint scheme changed from red to the black and yellow seen today. The work was completed in April 1803, and the ship left for Portsmouth the following month under her new captain, Samuel Sutton. Victory was under orders to meet up with Cornwallis off Brest, but after 24 hours of searching, failed to find him. Nelson, anxious to reach the Mediterranean without delay, decided to transfer to Amphion off Unshin. On May 28th, Captain Sutton captured the French ambuscade. HMS Victory joined Lord Nelson off Toulon, where on July 31st, Captain Sutton exchanged commands with the captain of Amphion. HMS Victory was passing the island of Toro in Majorca on April 4th, 1805, when HMS Faub brought the news that the French fleet under Pierre-Charles Villeneuve had escaped from Toulon. While Nelson made from Sicily to see if the French were heading for Egypt, Villeneuve was entering Cadiz to link up with the Spanish fleet. On May 9th, Nelson received news from HMS Orpheus that Villeneuve had left Cadiz a month earlier. The British fleet completed their stores in Lagos Bay, Portugal, and on May 11th sailed westward with 10 ships and 3 frigates in pursuit of the combined Franco-Spanish fleet of 17 ships. They arrived in the West Indies to find that the enemy was sailing back to Europe, where Napoleon Bonaparte was waiting for them and his invasion forces at Boulogne. The Franco-Spanish fleet was involved in the indecisive Battle of Cape Finisterre in fog off Ferro with Admiral Sir Robert Calder's squadron on the 22nd of July, before taking refuge in Vigo and Ferrell. Nelson continued on to England in HMS Victory, leaving his Mediterranean fleet with Cornwallis. After learning he was to be removed from command, Villeneuve put to sea on the morning of October 19th, and when the last ship had left port around noon the following day, he set sail for the Mediterranean. The British frigates, which had been sent to keep track of the enemy fleet throughout the night, were spotted at around 1900 hours, and the order was given to form a line of battle. On the morning of October 21st, the main British fleet, which was out of sight and sailing parallel some 10 miles away, turned to intercept. Nelson had already made his plans to break the enemy line two or three ships ahead of the commander-in-chief in the center and achieve victory before the van could come to their aid. At 0600 hours, Nelson ordered his fleet into two columns. The two columns of British ships slowly approached the French line before HMS Royal Sovereign, leading the Lee column, was able to open fire. Around 30 minutes later, HMS Victory broke the line between Bucantur and Redoubtable, firing a treble-shotted broadside into the stern of the former from a range of a few yards. At a quarter past one, Lord Horatio Nelson was shot, the fatal musket ball entering his left shoulder and lodging into his spine. He died at half past four. The incident had taken place on Victory's quarter deck. Nelson's last order was for the fleet to anchor, but this was countermanded by Vice Admiral Cuthbert Collinwind. HMS Victory had been badly damaged in the battle and was not able to move under her own sail. HMS Neptune therefore towed her to Gibraltar for repairs. The Admiralty Board considered HMS Victory too old 
and in too great a disrepair to be restored as a first-rate ship of the line. In November 1807, she was relegated to second-rate. She was recommissioned as a troop ship between December 1810 and April 1811. In 1812, she was relocated to the mouth of Portsmouth Harbor off Gosport for service as a floating depot and from 1813 to 1817 as a prison ship. Major repairs were undertaken in 1814. Active service was resumed on February 1817 when she was relisted as a first rate carrying 104 guns. However, her condition remained poor and in January 1822, she was towed into dry dock at Portsmouth for repairs to her hull. Refloated in January 1824, she was designated as the port's as the Port Admiral's flagship for Portsmouth Harbor, remaining in this role until April 1830. In 1831, the Admiralty issued orders for HMS Victory to be broken up and her timbers reused in other vessels. A public outcry against the destruction of so famous a ship led to the order being held in Abbeyans and HMS Victory was left, largely forgotten, at a Portsmouth mooring. Admiralty officially designated the aging vessel as a ship tender for the Port Admiral's flagship HMS Wellington and permitted civilian visitors to come aboard for tours. The ship briefly returned to the public gaze on July 18, 1833 when the Queen in Waiting, Princess Victoria, and her mother, the Duchess of Kent, made a visit to her quarter deck to meet with veterans of the Trafalgar campaign. Victoria returned for a second visit on October 21, 1844 and in 1889, HMS Victory was restored to a military function by being fitted up as a naval school of telegraphy. The school remained on Victory until 1904. Despite her reuse as a school, Victory continued to deteriorate at her morning. In 1903, she was accidentally rammed by HMS Neptune. Emergency repairs prevented her from sinking, but Admiralty again proposed that she be scrapped and it was only the personal intervention of Edward VII that prevented this from occurring. In 1910, the Society for Nautical Research was created to try to preserve her for future generations, but Admiralty was unable to help, having become embroiled in an escalating arms race. By 1921, the ship was in a very poor state, and a public Save the Victory campaign was started, with shipping magnate Sir James Card as a major contributor. The relocation to number two dock sparked public discussion about HMS Victory's future location. The naval architect who had surveyed the ship reported that she was too damaged to be moved. Admiralty formally adopted their advice and number two dock therefore became Victory's permanent home. During the initial restoration period from 1922 to 1929, a considerable amount of structural repair work was carried out above the warline and mainly above the middle deck. Restoration was suspended during the Second World War, and in 1941, HMS Victory sustained further damage when a bomb dropped by the Luftwaffe destroyed one of the steel cradles and part of the foremast. Listed as part of the National Historic Fleet, HMS Victory has been the flagship of the first Sea Lord since October 2012. Prior to this, she was the flagship of the second Sea Lord. She is the oldest commissioned warship in the world and attracts around 350,000 visitors per year in her role as a museum ship.